Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Social Media and Politics Podcast, bringing you expert insights into how social media is changing the political game. I'm your host, Michael Bassetta, Assistant Professor of Communication and Media at Loon University. Remember, you can follow the show on Twitter at SMNP Podcast or visit us on the web at socialmediaandpolitics.org. All right, y'all. Thanks so much for tuning in. In this episode, we're going to take a kind of broad view of the modern American campaign and have a discussion with my guest, Dr. Michael D. Cohen. He is the CEO of Cohen Research Group, which is a polling analytics and technology firm working with political campaigns. He's a lecturer at Johns Hopkins University and has a book coming out this week entitled Modern Political Campaigns, How Professionalism, Technology, and Speed Have Revolutionized Elections. That's published by Roman and Littlefield, and there'll be a link in the episode description with a 30% off coupon. So I definitely recommend picking it up, especially at that price point, because it is a really nice overview or handbook of all the different moving parts of the modern American campaign and how they work. So each chapter is dedicated to a different part of the campaign, whether that's fundraising or opposition research or paid media versus earned media versus social media, which of course we'll be talking about. And it's kind of cool because it's written as if you were running as a candidate. These are the things that you would need to consider. And it's filled with stories from Dr. Cohen's experiences and those of the practitioners that he interviews for the book. So I definitely recommend it. Again, if you are studying campaigns in the US or abroad, it's always nice to get a sense of all the different moving parts. And especially because we know campaigns are fast moving targets. They're changing their strategies every election cycle, it's great to have an updated uh, overview of all the different parts of a campaign, which I think when you're reading more of a heavy academic text, that it's sort of assumed that you know all of these different aspects of the campaign. So it's great to actually have a resource that says, okay, here's what campaigns do. Here are the different parts of them. And here are some stories that help illustrate the modern American campaign. So in this episode, we're going to be talking about campaigns broadly, of course, with a focus on social media. And I basically just picked out some interesting tidbits from the book that I wanted to drill deeper in with Dr. Cohen. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Dr. Michael D. Cohen. Again, he is the author of Modern Political Campaigns. Dr. Cohen, thanks for taking the time out. Welcome to the Social Media and Politics Podcast. Thanks so much. So first of all, congrats on the book. I found it to provide a concise yet detailed overview of the various moving parts involved in the modern American campaign apparatus. But before we dive into the ins and outs of the book in more detail, I'd like to start out with some theory as we usually do on the show. And even though the book reads as more applied, you start out by making the theoretical argument that campaigns have moved from being party-centered to candidate-centered, largely as a result of changes in communication technology. So could you recap that argument for us and how the centrality of candidates has shifted the role of political parties in the modern campaign? Oh, sure. I mean, first of all, once again, I mean, thanks so much for having me on the podcast. The way I see where we are today is we've moved away from institutions like political parties because of a shift in media and how candidates are covered. Television was the first big shift where voters could then watch and identify with their leadership and not political parties. And social media has really supercharged that. And it gives us sort of an unprecedented access to individual leaders And as you see, even today here in the United States, often at the expense of parties and larger institutions. In short, I mean, the more we know about our individual leaders, the more we identify with them and the less we identify with parties. And parties, on the other hand, have figured this out and they become more adjunct consultants than power brokers. And they know how to exercise their power. Sometimes when they exercise it too hard, it often boomerangs. So what they understand is this, is that candidates are coming to them as opposed to them going to find candidates in most cases, and that those people are sort of self-starters. And so it fits very well within the framework of political parties and sort of the decline of political parties, but it takes it one step further where you're saying they've declined in their power. But as I sort of talk through in the book, and I I know this because you read this book, which thank you very much, (laughs) um, is, (laughs) is that you know, the political parties are now in a situation where they're becoming more supportive than determinative. And I think that that's a major shift in where our thinking needs to be as political scientists and also as practitioners. Yeah. And, and I mean, I really imagine that for like the, the top of ticket, you know, national 
level campaigns. But I mean, uh, is the role of the parties more important the further we go down ballot? It is and it's not because what's happening is is that the doors are really being thrown open to running for office. I mean, there's sort of people who non-traditionally have decided that they're going to run, you know, usually parents of small children would normally put that on the back burner for a while, but you're seeing moms and dads deciding that they're going to run. You're seeing people who are more diverse running with diverse backgrounds, um, you know, sexual orientation, all manners of humanity running at least in the United States, that you didn't see throughout most of my career and certainly throughout most of my lifetime. And so to a real extent, all of that's being thrown open. And in many cases, the parties are not the ones who are picking them. They're sort of walking around going, okay, well, who could run and nudging people to consider it as opposed to you've served on the party committee for five years, it's your turn. It's very different now where they're running around trying to find people who could win. But also you have people who are self-identifying as candidates. And I think that that is really a big shift in how this is working. It's no longer, you know, party centered and it is candidate centered, but it's also sort of interactive between the two of them because the parties are obviously, you know, the big fortune 500 companies in these campaigns, but the individuals also have a huge say in how they run their campaigns, who they choose to run their campaigns and what they choose to campaign on and what they choose to focus on. Yeah, it's really interesting. I think you use the word at some point in the book talent, which reminds me of like, you know, uh, some kind of casting, which is essentially yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe not too far from 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 what's going on. And if the candidate or talent becomes uh, more important as a result of technology, there is still this kind of story or narrative that the candidate needs to get across. And in the book, you detail the importance of a campaign plan, which is this document that is drawn up before the candidate runs. And it outlines everything from previous turnout results, media markets, organization strategy. Strategy. I mean, there's really a lot of, of stuff in that document. But at the top line, you argue that the plan needs to include the candidate's rationale for why, what, and how they are going to run. So can you explain the importance of the campaign plan and how each of these communication aspects, the why, the what, and the how, are crucial for a successful campaign? Yeah, thank you. I mean, it's, it's actually one of the sort of the under radar things that really distinguishes a great campaign from a campaign that is just sort of very basic. So most campaigns will have a campaign plan which talks about more of the how and what. And the how is really like how you're going to win. The what is like what you need to win. But really the most important thing and the thing that I think is sort of overlooked, particularly by um, consultants, is the why. Um, The why in a competitive race I've seen over the years can actually distinguish who wins and who loses in a very close race. Now, in races that you know are either highly gerrymandered or you know there's really no major competition, it may not matter at all, or it may just matter in the primary. But the why, the reason why this person is running, if they can articulate it in a couple of sentences or a paragraph, really gives an organizing principle to the entire enterprise here. At a Fortune 500 company, this would be a mission statement. But in this case, it's much more core to who this person is. So, for example, you know, in 2016, you had one candidate who was running ostensibly because it was her turn. And you had another candidate who had a set of principles that he wanted to run on. And, you know, I'm not a fan of, frankly, either one of them. But if you're just breaking it down like you would, you know, a football game or something like that, you know, the players there, one knew what he wanted to accomplish and the other one knew they just wanted to win. There's a big difference. And so when you are thinking of running for office, the most important question to answer is why. And it's not just because I want the job. It's because you want to do something with that job. There's some reason, core reason why you care enough that you would want to interrupt your life enough to go and run for office. There are stories here, for example, in the United States of um, candidates who ran because they lost a family member to gun violence, or they had a small business and the taxes went so high that they couldn't afford to keep people on board. And so some of this comes to a personal story or it comes to some reason why if I meet you for the first time and I say, so, hey, why are you running? You don't give me some boilerplate BS. Um, You give me something that actually matters. And someone can connect with you and resonates with what you are as a person. And then from there, the what is, okay, how many votes do we need? how much money we have to make, who we have to hire, and then how 
okay, how do we deploy those resources in a, in a way to get to those goals? And those are all three together key portions of this campaign plan. If you don't do that, then you are putting yourself in a position where um, you're missing something super important about how to do this. But the most important thing more than anything else is to ask your candidate why they're running. And if they can't give you a good answer, chances are they just want it just to be elected. And those are frankly the worst kinds of people who are running. Right. And I mean, it, it obviously gets to this idea of authenticity, right? Having some authentic reason to run. But I'm wondering when you're trying to, you know, put this into a campaign plan, into a sort of document or boil it down to a few sentences. I mean, can this why message be something that's, you know, crafted to fit a certain audience? Or is this something that genuinely has to be authentic from the candidate? Well, there's no reason why it can't be both, right? So for example, let's say taxes were raised locally, you know, by the local county commission and you're running to get lower taxes. Well, that could be, for example, the number one issue in an area that you're trying to represent. And it could also be something that you felt personally. So there's no reason why you couldn't find that and something to connect to your audience that you're trying to, you know, motivate to vote for you. So, you know, the best of all kinds of whys is not just why you're running, but why someone would care. And if that does make a really good match between the two, then you can align it so that the campaign plan flows from that. And in most cases, people have multiple reasons why they're running. And what they can find is a reason that is very important to that person, but also is very important to the community. And so for both of those things to match up and then start to align the rest of the campaign be underneath it is actually the best of all situations. Gotcha. Yeah, it's interesting. It's really kind of, you really get to see the nuts and bolts that go into the, you know, so much planning even before someone commits to running. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, in in many cases, like I'm a pollster by training and um, by enterprise. And so a lot of my work uh, for a candidate, particularly at lower levels, would be um, in the front end trying to determine, okay, what does this race look like? What's our best messaging strategy? What are the things that we know about the other candidate um, that might be very important for us to highlight? And all of that polling happens before frankly, um, they buy, you know, a yard sign or, you know, or put up their website. Like all of that happens on the front end to help inform how we put all this together. And then, of course, you'll see, you know, the polling tracking as campaigns go along. But a lot of the strategic pieces of that happen before anyone really knows what's going on. Right. And I mean, there's these these questions, the why, the what, and the how, but you also note in the book uh, another very important question, which is, what do we need to know about you, the candidate, that they will try to use against you? Yes. And while <laughs> while much of the, the, the dirt digging on candidates is still gathered by pulling you know publicly available uh, records in person, there are some newer tactics that have opened up with digital and social media. So what are some of the ways to use digital and social media for, as you call them, the dark arts of opposition research? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was going to go with something like um, from Star Wars, you know, because I grew up, you know, in the seventies and eighties. But you know, Star Wars sort of fallen out of favor with the new the new movies. So <laughs> you know, J.K. Rowling's books are still beloved, and so I'm gonna, I'm going to hold on to that one for a while. Um, but the the way you deploy the dark arts is very different than what you would think. So you don't just deploy it late. You don't just deploy it on certain media. What it has to fit is it has to fit that core piece of story that we were talking about a little bit earlier. When you're putting together a campaign, you're not just saying, okay, well, why am I running? You're also looking and saying, well, why should that person that I'm trying to beat not win also? And it has to come down to a digestible story. And so, for example, let's say, um, you know, there's a garden variety cheat on my spouse situation, you know, who you're running up against. Well, in most cases, I mean, it's bad. It's not great. And certainly not something that most people would be proud of when confronted with. But it's much more of a compelling story if that person has also cheated on their taxes, has also cheated on um, contractors for their business or swindled customers. And so like this person could just be a cheat, right? And so when you're using all of that together on multiple platforms, including social media, All of that information comes together to paint a story of why you should be elected and why that person should not win the election. And so that contrast is really important. And to me, 
the platforms are interesting because they can sort of bring home different pieces of it. I mean, for example, on social media, you could be a lot more snarky about this. You could be a lot more tongue in cheek about this. Um, there could be a lot of visual aspects of this and it can get out there very quickly. And then obviously it could go viral if it's some, the kind of thing that would find its way going viral. Like if you had video of this person cheating, you've got something to work with, right? You know. So anyway, there's a lot of different ways to deploy this information. But what it comes down to is that if you're going to deploy the dark arts, you can't just do scattershot. You know, oh, this is bad. Oh, this is bad. Oh, this is bad. One of the stories from the book, um, a Democratic dark arts artist, shall we say, um, said to me, you know what? I get a lot of stuff. You know, there's a lot of stuff on everybody. You can find it on on the web and you can find, it, you know, digitally and all those kinds of things. But what really matters to me is, can I explain that to somebody? And that's the storytelling piece of this. And so if you can't do that, you know, you just get a whole bunch of sludge thrown up against somebody. Eventually, voters are going to look at you and go, well, why would I care? And by the way, you're kind of a jerk. Yeah. I mean, that, it's interesting, this idea of storytelling and, and contrast. I mean, uh, you also talk about in the book, um, the sort of Billy Bush Trump video, right, that we're all familiar with. And right. and now that I think about it, I mean, I guess, yeah, there wasn't much of a contrast there. It was just kind of a dump on Trump saying, look what he did, but it wasn't really drawn in contrast with Hillary Clinton. So maybe that's one reason why it wasn't particularly effective. Yeah. I mean, when you're looking at that, for example, like everybody knew going into it that Trump had cheated on multiple wives or probably was the kind of guy who said those things right in the Billy Bush video. So it wasn't the kind of thing where you were like, oh, my God, that's shocking. You're just kind of like, ew, you know, I guess that's real. <laughs> you know. Um, so to a certain extent, like that wasn't, you know, Billy Bush weekend, as, um, as Steve Bannon calls it, um, wasn't determinative because it was shocking by itself. But it's not shocking in context, and it doesn't tell a story that you hadn't already known, hmm. right? So you're, they weren't saying, okay, oh my God, Donald Trump is like the nicest guy ever, and he's had a single wife for the past thirty years, and all of his kids love him, and is no, it was like you know who this guy is, and yeah, he'd probably say that, you know, Ugh. and that's the reaction that you got here. It wasn't one of shock; it was just sort of like. Yeah. Oh, great. Um, and the other thing, too, that you get is that don't forget, this ha doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happens in comparison to Hillary Clinton. You know, the Clintons don't necessarily have a fantastic marriage. Right. You know, it's pretty clear that he cheated on her multiple times. It's pretty clear that she stayed with him. Um, and, you know, depending on who you are and where you sit politically, you may look at that and say, she should have dumped him in the 90s or why she stay with him. Oh, she stayed with him because she always wanted to be president. How gross. You know, I mean, there's a really fairly straightforward narrative of why if you didn't like Hillary Clinton, you could sort of talk yourself into the idea that, yeah, what Trump did was gross. But what, you know, she's been doing for all these years is even more dishonest because she stayed in a marriage you know, where she was treated so poorly and what kind of a person is that and why would I want that person as my president? So there's a lot of stuff going on there, right? Now, if Bill and Hillary had never had any issues between them and, you know, everyone, you know, thought of the two of them as a great couple and she was a very honest person, you know, she was trustworthy, um, they would have looked at this and been like, Ooh, yeah, you know, he's, he's more of a risk than I really want to take or he doesn't represent who I want to be. But this was a very unique election in my lifetime, at least, where you had two candidates that were completely flawed in so many different ways that that's why it was you know more of a coin flip than anything else at that moment. Yeah, and I want to I want to keep on um, sort of attacks, which is you know it's such a feature of American politics. It's also a bug. <laughs> um, and you know, in the book, you discuss this difference between campaigns and independent groups, right? And I'm th think about the, the difference in messaging between the two. So looking at social media posts, for example, um, if you look at the candidates pages, you may see them sort of, quote unquote, attack a candidate in the text of a post. But if you look at their ads, it, it's really not where the real nasty attack ads are happening. And so I wanted to ask you, you know, looking at campaign strategy, what's the division between the kind of immediate campaign organization and its extensions in the form of things like political action committees in terms of messaging? It's a really great question. And by law in the United States, those groups can't coordinate, at least overtly. So what you often find is this. You find friends of 
the candidate or friends of people who are running the campaigns going off and running the political action committee. So they don't work together for that cycle, but everybody knows the strategy on, you know, who's what and what the kinds of things that they're going to be able to do. So it's sort of a very unwritten and more subtle coordination, but it's more a coordination of of tactics as well as strategy, but it comes down to that they they can't work together day to day. So for example, the campaign will probably do most of their messaging and it will probably be mostly positive, whereas the political action committees will probably be mostly negative. And you find this in a lot of campaigns, um, especially well-funded ones, where the political action committee will go as far out as they possibly can with the attacks. They'll probably use most of the opposition research they find. The campaigns will use it in debates. They'll use it in sort of posts here and there, but they won't really go on attack as much. And the reason is simple, is that if the political action committee goes too far, you can disavow it. You could say, you know what? That's not what I would have wanted. And this is just another example of how we're not working with these guys, even though you think we're working with these guys. And so the nastiest stuff usually comes from the political action committees, not the official candidate that counts, and rarely from the candidate themselves. I mean, Trump was sort of an outlier there where you know, he took it upon himself to really attack his opponents. Um, that really isn't the standard bear um, in our politics. Yeah. And that's one thing you get when when reading the book is, you know, each chapter is sort of dedicated to a specific part of the campaign. And, and you know, social media is there, but it's in a sense, it's such a small part of the overall campaign apparatus. And so I, I wanted to ask, you know, what's the utility of social media then um, in terms of, you know, the whole campaign operation? Well, I mean, for, it's, a, it's a really good question. I think it's become a much larger portion of it. So, for example, a guy like Brett Parscale, who was essentially Trump's uh, social media director, um, got promoted to uh, running the campaign in 2020. Um, you're seeing a lot of that. And the way a lot of these campaigns are organized and have organized for years, the people who used to be really great at TV ads or radio ads or sort of traditional advertising, they would get the general consultant title. And so they would hire the rest of the teams. And so the people who were in charge of the message were the people who would sort of run the show. What you're finding now more and more is that people who have social media background and, and expertise are actually doing more, or the people who are good at traditional media have also added social media as an expertise as well, or, or product and service that they can sell. And so a lot of this stuff is just getting put into sort of that communications bucket. Social media, what's really good about it, obviously, is that it's fast and it can get out very quickly and it doesn't cost as much money. So you can run um, social media ads for much cheaper and much more targeted um, to people than you can, for example, a TV ad. So that's, that's one part. Now, the earned media side of it is that you could sort of put things out there and see what sticks or at least see what sort of bubbles up. And that can give you a sense of like where the campaign might be going. So which issues are really popping, um, which messages are really working in particular as opposed to the broad themes. And those are really helpful. And I would say from a social media standpoint, it's where most people's eyeballs are now. You know, they are either on streaming devices, um, less so on traditional TV. And this is where people are. So you have to get yourself to the point where you're really good at it because that's how people are being communicated to. Now, the utility of it from a researcher standpoint. So in other words, if you and I were to dork out and write a paper together on this, a candidate's account is only super interesting to me if it's actually the candidate and not the staff. In most cases, the staff are actually doing the tweeting or the posting or stuff like that. One of the remarkable things about Trump and one of the reasons why um, we're all talking about authenticity now is because when Trump tweeted, it was Trump. I mean, it wasn't Dan Scarvino. It, it was Trump. And or it was Trump dictating, you know, Scarvino. So to a real extent, if you're trying to understand who that person is and style and temperament, as well as what they're interested in, it's super important to understand whether or not that person who is running is, you know, posting themselves or having staff do it. If they're having staff do it, then it's less interesting, but it's also just sort of interesting to see how the campaign is evolving, right? 
But it's much more interesting if it's the candidate because it's it's a way to reveal who that candidate is. And if I were to do research on that, I would actually have you know a flag for accounts that are either being posted by the candidate or um, posted by the staff. So for example, on Twitter, you knew Trump was tweeting. On Facebook, he wasn't writing out Facebook posts. So the, the voice there was actually a little different. So you have to then put that in the context as you're analyzing what's being posted. Otherwise, you're sort of missing the, the big um, divide between that data. Yeah, and I can I can say from from looking at some of these these posts from 2020, and of course we don't know you know when the candidate versus when the the staff is is writing a message unless the candidate signs off on it. But what I see a lot of is uh, screenshots of tweets that are then posted to other platforms, and I think the idea is that people think it's the candidate tweeting, so they want to take the actual words from from the Twitter account and then post it on different platforms. I don't know if that's a Trump effect, but it's it's kind of an interesting thing I've observed. Yeah, it is very interesting. And it's also not great, right? Because each platform has its own strengths and weaknesses, and you can't make Facebook Twitter just by screenshotting it and posting it, right? I mean, the Facebook is great for you know other reasons, whereas Twitter is great for sort of being in the moment and you know, short, quick, you could be even snarky or aggressive. Whereas Facebook is much more a space where you're there with your friends and family, as opposed to Twitter, where you're basically in the public square, you know, on a soapbox. And so you have to imagine those are just very different places, even though they're metaphysical and they're online, they're very different places where people go for different things. So if I'm going on Facebook, I'm going to see like, you know, pictures from the latest baseball game, you know, where our kids played, right? Or my son's Taekwondo video from last night, or my daughter's event, you know, where she's president of her fraternity, you know, at, at college. You know, I'm not in the mindset of politics, right? So if I get slammed with something that's a tweet, you know, that's a little jarring. You know, that's it's sort of off where I expect to be. Whereas if I'm on Twitter, I know it's going to be quick. It's going to be sort of in the moment. And it probably will be fairly aggressive. So, you know, if you're posting, I don't know. The other things that you would post on Facebook where, you know, you might post a long speech or you might post, a, you know, sort of a, a longer post or, you know, pictures of people sort of being together. That's different than Twitter, where Twitter is much more political and much more aggressive. So I think that even though campaigns are doing that, where they're trying to sort of, you know, bring forward the authenticity that from Twitter to Facebook, it's actually a mistake because it's really not a great strategy and a great use of Facebook to, to work in that way. Yeah, they should, you know, have the distinct platforms marked out in their campaign plan, right? Correct. Yeah. And <laughs> and it, it'd be nice, right? Um, or at least have some kind of organizing principle. Right? For example, you know, on Facebook, we're going to use the voice of your neighbor. You know, on, on Twitter, we're going to be the person who's fighting for you. And maybe on Instagram, it'll be a very, um, you know, sort of visual place that you could see how the campaign is operating, right? You know, there's a number of different ways you could sort of approach it and still, you know, stay on plan and still stay on your main story. Definitely. And, you know, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is uh, is, is data and analytics, because, you know, this is increasingly important for campaigns from the practitioner perspective, but it's also important for academics who are studying these things. And you're in the interesting position where you've worn both hats, um, you know, both an academic and a practitioner. And you discuss this in the book a few times, kind of saying the difference between the type of data that political scientists look at versus the type of data that practitioners use to optimize their their messaging, for example. And I mean, obviously, consumer data is crucial to the modern US campaign, but how might practitioners be using data or different data types in a way that academics typically don't? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, I mean, as an academic, I mean, I had a really great opportunity when I was at GW to use a tool called Crimson Hexagon which you know, does a really great job of helping you dive into social media posts, particularly on Twitter, because the data is open. Facebook is very difficult to get any kind of really great read on there. So that's why we all default to Twitter, because Twitter is open. And so you're paying for a platform, right? Even at academic pricing, it's not cheap. Uh, consumer data is extraordinarily expensive, and frankly, is only really great 
when you have it over time and when it's connected to other things. And so, you know, as an academic, it's very hard to get the kind of data that you would get out of data trust here in the United States or um, L2. Um, there's a lot of different groups as well as organizations where you can buy them from that give you more than just, did this person vote in the last election? Um, did they vote in a primary? Where do they live? That kind of stuff. Uh, you get a lot more about what they purchase. Um, and putting all of that stuff together really gives you a sense of who they are, um, what their donation patterns are like, and some other behavior. Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to take it past where polling has taken us to the modern era and, and essentially the sort of data revolution in politics. We used to only know what people thought or at least what we thought they thought, right? Because they only what they would tell us in polls as opposed to what they might not tell us. And then from there, we've now been able to make the leap to what did they do? Like, what are their behaviors? And so when you can get consumer data, it's super helpful because it gets you in the mindset of who you're trying to move. So instead of just getting basic demographics, you could also get the kinds of brands, the kinds of things that they really care about and buy. And when you have that kind of a picture, you really have a better sense of who you're talking to and where um, those people actually communicate with each other and where you can communicate with them. Yeah, it's interesting. It gets back to this idea of context we were talking about before. Right. Um, and and I mean, okay, one thing is the the cost to access these you know commercial data warehouses is super expensive, but it's also expensive to pay the salaries for people who can glean insights from this data, right? It's a pretty high level analytical technique. And you argue towards the end of the book that the new permanent campaign keeps these data analytics skills in demand between election cycles. So what is the new permanent campaign and how are professional campaigners finding work outside of formal electoral campaigns? Great question. Great question. So before we get to the new permanent campaign, we'll just talk about the permanent campaign for a second. So this was a term by Pat Cadell, who was um, Jimmy Carter's pollster. And so he was trying to convince Carter, uh, after they won, to keep campaigning to hold on to public support so they can win their agenda. It was actually a very forward-thinking idea that you don't just shift from campaigning to governing, that basically all of this is campaigning, that you're trying to keep the public engaged so that you can get support and get perceived support on Capitol Hill and so that you can get what you want, right? Now, Carter, of course, really didn't follow the advice and really had kind of a rough go of it. Um, but the new permanent campaign is more of what happens in between that president and Congress nexus. It's sort of this area in politics where um, the best consultants leverage their expertise in the policy arena. And that sort of runs counter to what Cadell was trying to do. Cadell was trying to run a permanent campaign from the White House. And this is the new permanent campaign is run sort of from the outside in. And so this is from interest groups. This is from trade groups. This may even be from subgroups of parties. Those kinds of things pushing elected officials to do what they want from the outside in as opposed to from the inside out. And what is really super interesting about this whole thing is that in off years, today's consultants now work with Fortune 500 companies and with trade groups and with nonprofits to help them with their constituencies and their and their customers, both of which actually really care a lot more about the public policy arena than they ever have. So you have sort of a revolution in who you're buying from you actually care about. If you think about you know, the way we used to live our lives, we used to live our lives in smaller towns, we would know who we're buying from. I mean, now you're buying from Amazon.com or larger companies, but you want them also to feel like that they're reflecting your values. And so a lot of these companies are spending tons of money to understand, okay, how am I being perceived by the public? Uh, what are the issues that I actually need to engage on, even if it's not something that I really care about very much? And what are the things I need to absolutely avoid so I don't piss off my customers or find myself in a regulatory situation? And so all of that stuff is actually relatively new in American politics and probably even newer overseas by you and everywhere else. And it was actually the subject of my dissertation like in 1996. 
And so, you know, like the first big effort here was the Harry and Louise campaign for um, healthcare reform under the Bill Clinton candidacy and then his presidency. The hospital organizations ran um, a set of ads that had this couple that was at their dinner table, very concerned about how much all of this was going to cost. And the ads were targeted at um, certain members of the Senate who frankly were on the bubble as to whether or not they were gonna support it or not and help tip the scales to kill the plan. And so nothing in American politics teaches like losing. And so as soon as they lost, everyone realized, oh my God, this is actually now the way politics could really work. And before you know it, you know, we're now 25 years ish later and every single major campaign for anything in this country is um, not only being pushed by members of Congress and the president or even at different levels of, of government here, but also by outside interest groups who pay on that sort of Harry and Louise model. And so the new permanent campaign is really sort of the interactive between the policymakers and the broader public and even rich individuals who, who go out and buy ads because they have a particular interest in, in something. Um, and so it, it is really like, instead of just playing like one-on-one -on -one basketball, you're now playing like one on 20 <laughs> and you'd never know who's going to check in and who's going to, you know, be a 300 pound banger who's going to knock you over or someone who's going to shoot the three and just knock you out to death from, from deep. <laughs> you know, you really don't have a sense of who's going to come at you. You just know that a lot of people are. Right. And, and, you know, this is something that, that you also discuss in the book is the uh, uh, emergence of things like Win Red and Act Blue and the kind of rivalry between um, these two sort of donation platforms and the whole right. being internet enabled. And it, it made me think about, um, you know, lots of academics have written about campaigners who go on to form their consultancies like Blue State Digital and then come back into campaigns. And I'm just curious because you've, you've been in the game for, for a while now. Um, is this something that is more fluid. One of the things that I, I secretly love to do is follow everyone who's a campaigner on Twitter and kind of check in on their, their conversations. And they're just moving around from campaign to campaign, which I guess has always been. But is there something that's more fluid and dynamic because of these transferable skills with technology? Or am I, am I off on that? I don't think you're particularly off on it. But I, I think what, what is happening, though, is that um, instead of moving from campaign to campaign, they have clients. So a consultancy might have multiple clients and a consultancy, you might see the person and you might see them, oh, they're, they popped up on this campaign and they pop up on this campaign, but they have a firm behind them usually. Whereas like when I was first starting out um, in you know the late nineties, you would work on a campaign, then you'd work on another campaign and you'd work on another campaign. But once that you get to the point where you've accumulated enough skills and certainly enough potential clients, you can then open up your own shop and then you have a team behind you that also includes people who can help service those campaigns. And so even though you're seeing these people on Twitter, they're usually not the only people, you know, who are just jumping from one to another. They're just the people you see, right? So, you know, Tony Fabrizio is one of my former uh, mentors and he's still a great guy and we, we talk here and there. And so if you see like Fabrizio and Lee, which is the current version of this firm uh, that does politics, and you'll see Tony Fabrizio on, on TV and, you know, he would, he was a former Trump pollster. And so he went from Rick Scott to Donald Trump, but you would think that he's jumping from one campaign to another when in reality, he just, he has his firm and those are just his clients. And so that's, that's, that's the relationship there. Um, now, when you're younger, um, a lot of my students, for example, they'll jump on a campaign for a cycle, like a student of mine who um, named Arden, who is wonderful, uh, who jumped on the Warren campaign. Now, and that, you know, didn't work out, you know, she moved on to another one. And so that's understandable within a cycle. But within a cycle where the candidate's going all the way, if you're younger, you're probably on that campaign all the time. And if you're older, you're probably working on that campaign uh, or more experience, you're working on that campaign probably with a few others as well. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, there, there's so many moving parts. Yeah. And I think we've only covered a, a fraction of the book here. I mean, there's all sorts of 
chapters on paid and earned media, field operations, focus groups, fundraising. Um, and I, I wanted to ask you, you know, what's your take? Is the professionalization of campaigning in the U.S. just getting out of control? And second part to that question is if there's one thing that you could change about the modern campaign to make it more democratic, what would that be? Well, I don't think it's getting it out of control. I mean, I think professionalization in any field is actually a good thing. Um, instead of people just sort of walking around based upon relationships and getting jobs or getting clients, it's actually nice to see people having credentials. You know, so for example, I worked over at GW um, and I went to the University of Florida. Both of them have campaigning programs, you know, where you learn techniques and you learn the business and you learn to be a professional as opposed to just being a hack, right? Because that's like the, the worst thing you can be called. Even though hacks, you know, you, you would call your, your friends in an industry, oh, we're just hacks here and just joke around about it. But in reality, the people who go into this now are more prepared than ever. And then the people who are working on it, on these campaigns, are much more um, train, well-trained and know much more than, frankly, in the past 25 years. I think that's actually good. So I, I don't have a problem with professionalization of politics. What I do have a problem with is how, and what I would change, is really how data is used. What happens is, is that you get, let's say, a data set. And it says, okay, these people, if they're activated, can move, and it's sort of fairly easy to make happen, right? So you have a sense that you know there's a certain set of the population that you can now identify because you have great data. That if all you had to do is maybe send them one or two mailers or knock on their doors or do certain things with certain messaging and you can get them to come out and vote for you. Well, that's great. But the thing is, is that both sides now have access to the same kind of data. So at some level, you know, there are two parties who, are, who have gotten to parity in the United States, at least, on how data is being used. But what they've done is they've sort of doubled down on what they know. So they go as hard as they can to get their people out on one side and as hard as they can to get their people out on the other side. But what they're missing, though, and what has totally made this polarization of our politics worse, is that you're only talking to these people because you only think they're the only people you need. What I hope is, is that eventually data scientists and communications consultants get together toward building you know, a center out set of politics. And so what you would find, I think, is that at some point, the parties are going to maximize how much they could possibly do on their own base. And then you have to start looking more towards the middle. And as you nudge towards the middle, you get to the point where you are getting truly undecided voters. And it may not be a lot, but I think the campaign that is able to understand how to motivate those people and how to reach them could revolutionize how politics is done moving forward. And frankly, I think that with the kinds of modeling that's going on right now and the kinds of people who are coming into this who have such high expertise and, and you used to go into political science like if you hated math, right? <laughs> now you go into political science and you have to know math or you have to be math friendly. And so once you have sliced and diced your own potential supporters to the point where there's really no other utility, you then have to start looking elsewhere. And my hope is that the models lead them to where they should go, which is towards the middle. And that would actually change how politics is practiced. Because imagine if a politics where you had to build your coalitions to win more from the center out than from the edges in, you then would have different policies. You would have different policy making processes. There'd be much more collegiality. And I understand that most hacks would look, talk to me about this and most pros would look at me and say, oh, that's just a dream. I get it. But that's your question. <laughs> you know, your question is, where would I like it to be? That's where I would like it to be, that somehow, some way, we use all the powers that we've learned over the past 25 years for good and say, OK, we've ran that play. There's only so much we can do in a polarized electorate if we run it a different way maybe we could win more elections and do the right thing. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and as ever on this podcast, the last question is not the last question because it, it makes me think of um, you know this idea of, of prototype campaigns, which is the idea that, okay, Howard Dean forged using the internet, um, you know, and he failed, but then right. you know, Obama was the one who was successful with it. So there, it, there, there could be a case where perhaps polarization reaches its peak and 
that forces a prototype campaign to try exactly what you're 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 talking about, sort of working from the the center out, that may not win, but shows promise, and then that could very easily shape the modern or I don't know postmodern, however you want to call it, political campaign. Yeah, the postmodern <laughs> political campaign. That's great. Yeah, great, great, great name for the sequel. The postmodern. That's it. That's the name campaign. for your next book. Yeah. Oh, I appreciate that. That's helpful. It's better than what the working title, which was, um, I don't know, the sequel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Spaceballs is the sequel. I mean, but I'll say this: um, there are signs of that, right? So if you were if you were watching closely Biden's campaign, Biden was very resistant to his left in almost every single way, shape, and form during the primary um, on, you know, Medicare for all on. Green New Deal, a lot of the major further left of center than than center, shall we say. And he resisted all of that. Now, that was a winning coalition. You know, he saw himself as building from the center out, not from the left in. I don't know that people have really gotten that memo yet on at the GOP. I still think that they're sort of doubling down on their people because they think that redistricting in this country where the lines are drawn differently, um, we'll get them over the hump and get them to win the House and maybe even the Senate. That is possible. And frankly, it's increasingly likely um, in the House, if not the Senate. But if you want to take the learning from losing to Joe Biden, the answer there is you know, more of a center out than an edge in kind of a campaign. And I hope that you know, it may take more than one cycle for that to get through, but if it does, then that may actually force um, the Republican Party to take another look at itself and say, you know what, maybe we need to go a different, a different way. And frankly, also say to his own party that that's a winning formula and we should double down on that. Yeah, it's interesting. Maybe this uh, the sort of trends towards polarization aren't uh, exponentially linear. Eventually, they will uh, they will correct. Interesting. Well, definitely. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> well, at least for now, in the way that campaigns are run for for the short and near term, uh, I think your book does an excellent job of giving a you know holistic handbook to people who who are both experts but also novices to kind of catch up and get up to speed on the modern U.S. campaign. So, Dr. Cohen, thanks so much for taking the time out and sharing your insights with us. Well, thanks so much for having me. Great podcast. I appreciate it. I've just been speaking with Dr. Michael D. Cohen, author of Modern Political Campaigns. If you want to pick up the book, get 30% off by using the link in the episode description. And that's a wrap for this episode of the Social Media and Politics Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. So coming up on the show, I think I'm going to record one or two more episodes before taking a break for the summer to recharge. And I think one of those will be digital strategy during Andrew Yang's campaign and another focusing on a really interesting campaign on tech advocacy. But until then, I'm your host, Michael Bassetta, signing off from Melba. See you next time.